the topic that we're going to talk about today, the chronic wasting disease, is really, really serious. And I hope that we can try to figure out how to see our way through this, because there is hope. I'm going to have to scare the hell out of you, but there is hope if we pay attention. So this issue, chronic wasting disease, is a sister disease to mad cow. So you know, scientific category of diseases as transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. We have just completed what I guess is probably the most comprehensive paper that's ever been done on the broad perspective of this, summarizing the science. The, the threat that we're facing to our wildlife, to our deer, our elk, our moose, um, our caribou, these are all animals that are susceptible to this. And the um, the paper that we've, we've released sums it up in two words, insidious and dire. Without immediate action to prevent worst case outcomes, we're facing depletions, extinctions, crashing economies, and potentially, and this is true, millions of human lives at stake. And I don't want to blow that out of proportion, I'll get back to that later, but the biggest part of this problem is that CWD itself is not the problem. It's a symptom. And to actually solve this problem, we have to understand why CWD isn't the problem. So in the early 1990s, I don't know if you remember this, but Professor Geist and I were going around pleading with people to understand that tuberculosis wasn't the problem. It was something else. And we were trying to explain that if they couldn't understand that TB wasn't the problem, they could be facing something a lot worse, like CWD. Well, nobody knew who that was. And the final uh, element of this that's probably astonishing, but it also gives us hope, is that this isn't an accident. We've done this to ourselves. So part of what I want to do to start off is to get a notion of how CWD is just representative of a, a lot bigger story, because this isn't an accident. We did this to ourselves, but that's almost the rule, right? Because we're facing enormous threats all the time, over and over and over again, and they were there, they were hiding in plain sight, but we didn't see them. We have incredible teams of scientists looking into every realm of science you can imagine. There are crises right in front of us, we don't see them. We, we face all kinds of stuff, and it's not just that the science is there, this is the information age. You can put a supercomputer in your pocket. You're constantly connected to the world of information, and yet huge, huge problems sneak out. They bite us in the ass, we don't see them coming. So we're facing diseases and depletions and extinctions and refugees and terrorists, and the, the real stark reality is that we've created most of these things. And some, some people have said, well, you know, if money was involved, then this wouldn't happen. We need to dispense with this right away. In 2007 and 8, we faced global financial collapse. The world's financial markets crashed. Well, guess what? All of the world's experts, the bankers, the Federal Reserve, the journalists, the economists, were looking especially the journalists and all the people that are investing in markets, they're looking for any indication of something that they, they can make money from. And you can certainly make money from crashing markets. That's what these guys did. I don't know if you've seen this movie, The Big Short. This is a true story. This physician figured out that the mortgage market was not stable. He actually went to the banks and created instruments to bet against the mortgage market called credit default swaps. The banks were so arrogant that they allowed them, they created these instruments to let them bet against the, the market. And they ended up making billions of dollars while the markets crashed. And so not only do the experts not see this coming, but sometimes we have really, really important people that you think people would pay attention to trying to warn us that things are coming. This is Bill Gates, richest guy on the planet. You'd think people would pay attention to him. This is at a TED Talk in Vancouver in, a couple of years ago in 2015. And Bill has a new, he's retired, so his new day job, he actually wheeled this barrel out on the stage. He was using it as a prop to explain that when he was a kid, the great threat to the planet was from missiles. 
And so if the worst happened, nuclear war, he and his family were supposed to go down into the basement and eat out of that barrel. Now, oddly enough, Bill Gates wasn't there to talk about how stupid that was. He was there to say that today, the great threats to the planet are probably not from missiles, they're from microbes, from infectious diseases. And he says, we're not ready. But guess what? The TED audience is pretty enlightened, but they, they paid way more attention to a different talk at the same TED conference. This woman was there to do a presentation about a sexual affair that she had 20 years earlier. It got three times the number of watches as Bill Gates did, right? And the mainstream media, they completely ignore Bill Gates, but they were all over the Monica Lewinsky story. And they just completely forgot about the, the message that she was to, trying to get across is the, the problem of shaming. They just went for the sex and the politics. So this is part of what we have to deal with because we're biological beings and there's a bioeconomy out there, sex sells. So call it 50 shades of green, this is what we're facing with, because we have dire problems, and yet, sex sells. Um, this is the cover issue of Sports Illustrated. Their swimsuit issue has nothing to do with sports, but it's a bill Forbes says this is a billion-dollar industry. So people in this room are probably not interested in this at all. This is the one that you're interested in, the cover edition of Sports Illustrated magazine 2013. Okay, so why is this relevant to this room? This is Ray Lewis, Baltimore Ravens linebacker. Look over his right shoulder. I'll zoom in for you here. He was accused of using a weird performance-enhancing drug, velvet antler spray. This was so bizarre, it went absolutely everywhere. And it was so crazy that you couldn't tell the difference between the mainstream anchors that were talking about this, because it wasn't just football. It was baseball, it was hockey, it was Vijay Singh, the golfer. It was across MMA stars. This was a huge thing. And you couldn't tell the difference between the anchors and the late night comedians. This is uh, Stephen Colbert. But sadly, folks, the game itself is being marred by accusations about one of the star players. Baltimore Ravens linebacker Ray Lewis is denying a Sports Illustrated report that claims that he used a banned substance while recovering a torn triceps this season. The article claims Lewis was given deer antler spray to speed up his recovery. It comes from what they call the velvet of deer antlers. Deer antler spray? Yes, deer antler spray. Which, of course, was banned after Lance Armstrong became the first hooved winner of the Tour de France. <laughs> Uh, evidently, evidently, I did not know this, but deer antlers contain a hormone called IGF-1 that is thought to help muscle recovery. <laughs> Personally, I think all the players should take this stuff. The NFL has a real head injury problem, and antlers are nature's helmets. <laughs> In fact, you know what? All football teams should be permitted to take performance-enhancing drugs as long as they are extracted from their team's mascot. <laughs> I say let the Chicago players inject bear bile. Let Cincinnati snort tiger dong. And the Washington, whoa. <laughs> Full disclosure, folks. Full disclosure, it's important to me. This issue is personal for me because I too have been accused by my rivals of abusing deer antler spray. I guess they wonder how I can keep this up night after night without ever... So while Stephen Colbert and everybody else is laughing at this, what's bizarre about this is that they missed the real story. They completely missed the real story. This is a huge problem. It's one of these things that's hanging in plain sight. It's right there, right in front of all of them. And because they missed the story, um, exposure drives sales, just like it does with the swimsuit issue. They expose as much as they can, sales go up, right? This drove sales of velvet antler spray actually up. And then there were all these lawsuits. These very wealthy athletes started suing. And the answer from the World Anti-Doping Agency was to green light it, they made it legal. What they didn't check, what was hiding in plain sight, is that this, they didn't even ask where this was coming from. 
The industry that produces velvet antler spray is a huge problem. Game farming is a disease factory. But this is a problem of perspective, and this is where we do have some hope. So this is a, an issue that has been looked at by world-class people like economist Garrett Hardin, who looked at this and he said, this is the tragedy of the commons. And he used a, an example in economics to show why this was happening. And he used a, a, an example of a common pasture. But the economic model that he put forward didn't account for the reality that this happens whether it's common property, public property, or private. The most, some of the most severe depletions have happened not on public or common property, but on private land. So what's really going on, I call it micro-market myopia. This is a problem where we have a micro-focus measured in money in the marketplace, and it's done only over the short term. If we do that, that's how these things hide in plain sight because our perspective is flawed. We don't see these things coming, so is there a solution to this? Of course, comprehensive analysis. We have to look carefully. We have to understand that we can't look just narrowly. We have to look broadly. We have to understand that biology and business are not just interconnected. One is a complete subset of the other. There are no markets absent life. And then finally, we know that we have to look not just to the short term, we have to look to the long term. And when we do that, when we look carefully, that analysis is a great benefit. I call that a public systems asset. And it's the core of all of our governance. It's the core of our institutions. It's the core of law. And it applies to things like President Eisenhower in the United States created the interstate highway system. And it turned out that the cost of construction and maintenance of that highway was blown away by the value of creating the veins and arteries through which everything in the economy was moving for producers and consumers. An educated workforce, that's a public systems asset. Healthcare, an, uh, a healthy workforce, that's a public systems asset. And this is all, this speaks to the public trust doctrine. And what we have as wildlife was established under the public trust doctrine as one of the greatest public systems assets in history. Now in law, this is what the public, the public trust doctrine looks like, but I want to talk about wildlife as one of the greatest ever public trusts. Because I call this the greatest story never told because the vast majority of people don't understand it. So let's look back a couple hundred years, a little bit more. Thomas Jefferson was elected president of the United States, came to, to office in 1801. He sent Lewis and Clark out on their incredible expedition to document the people, the resources, the wildlife, and, the, uh, and so on of the uh, geography of the, the continent. Now, if you read their journals, they ran out of words to explain the wildlife that they saw. It was unbelievable. 60 million bison, 40 million antelope, dozens of millions of deer. There were so many birds that they would blacken out the sun when they were migrating. Okay, we don't have much time, so fast forward 100 years. Vice President Teddy Roosevelt is hunting in the Adirondacks when President McKinley is assassinated. Now, the Washington Press Corps, they said, oh, great, now that damn cowboy is president. Well, what's that about? Because Teddy Roosevelt is revered today as the conservation president. Well, it turned out that all of that wildlife that was there, not a little, all of it was on the brink of extinction. Some of it had gone completely extinct. So... It was not just the ungulates, not just 60 million bison, not just the deer and so on. Songbirds, shorebirds, migratory birds, they were all at the brink of extinction. So Teddy Roosevelt, President, Prime Minister Laurier, pulled together their best people, the best scientists from both countries, and they did a comprehensive analysis to try to figure out, well, first of all, I had to find out what the hell happened. Well, it didn't take them long to answer that question. This is a photograph of a wagon load of elk going to market. Here are just a few bison skulls going to market. Here are just a few feathers going to market. That um, photograph in the lower left, that's more than a thousand hummingbird skins that were on their way to Europe because they put the feathers in ladies' hats. The moral of the story, if you put a price on the head of something that's dead, that's what you get. So. The best of the best from both countries got together in a series of conferences 
not unlike this one. And they looked at the problems and they said, what the hell are we going to do? So they put together a series of laws that took control of wildlife as a public resource that had been declared by the Supreme Court in Martin v. Waddell in 1842, reaffirmed in the 1890s. And then they passed all these laws to um, try to protect what was left. We now know it as the North American model of wildlife conservation. And it has seven principles. The first was de the declaration that this is a public resource. They put a prohibition on the marketing of dead wildlife. They said that they were going to allocate wildlife only by law. You couldn't hunt it even if you owned the land it didn't belong to you. There was going to be equal opportunity for all. They said there was killing only for legitimate cause, for food or for predator control, not for sale. And then they knew that this was an international resource, so we got, we got treaties. And they said, look, we need science and evidence as the basis of public policy. So what was the result? The world's greatest environmental success story. We did it here. For almost no money, we passed some laws. And when we did this, when we replenished this wildlife, we stumbled into the golden goose because it generates massive amounts of enterprise enjoying wildlife, making and selling a mountain of outdoor equipment, providing all the services that this, um, this wildlife uh, uh, has people out there hunting and fishing and bird watching and so on. So how big is this success? These data are, are old now, but in 1996, um, the activities of hunting, fishing, and wildlife associated recreation of public wildlife generated $12.1 billion to our GDP. That number is almost identical to the $12.3 billion that was the total contribution to GDP in the same year from all of agriculture. But there are two additional benefits that I don't even know how you put a price on. The first is that if you're going to protect wildlife as a public resource, it's valuable only when it's alive. There's an implicit demand that you conserve wild places. You have to protect habitat. How the hell do you put a price on that? And secondly, protecting healthy wildlife had a huge advantage that we didn't really understand because it turns out that it's as important for us as it is for the wildlife. And it's because of this incredible and hidden factor that we didn't really understand for a long time. Most, and probably all, of the infectious diseases that we suffer come to us from animals. McNeil's right about this, but there's a mystery. And it has two parts. The first is that it's really hard to get a disease to jump a species barrier. And the second is it's even harder to get some, something that jumps a species barrier and then is contagious in that new species. So if those two things are true, and they are, then how do we explain that most of our diseases come from animals? Well, it's because of this. It's because of pathogenesis. It's because of domestication. Domestication and its diseases has been hiding in plain sight. Jared Diamond put this book out in 1997. And ironically, at the time, I, along with Val Geis and some other people, were working on exactly the same thing. We were looking into the background. So why is it that domestication is such a disease factory? Well, let's start with something that every single person in this room is familiar with. What happens when you catch a wild animal? It's terrified. OK, what does that mean biologically? Well, its heart is racing, its blood pressure is sky high, its respirations are up, it's pumping out massive amounts of adrenaline and cortisol and other stress hormones. It's directing blood flow to the large muscle masses, getting it ready to fight or flee for its life. OK, so that's very cool. But the same endocrine system that does that is also responsible for our adaptive immune system. So turns out that stress compromises immune system, uh, our immune system. And there are two new fields of science now, one called psychoneuroendocrinology, the, the other is psychoneuroimmunology, that look at how stress affects us. But it doesn't just affect us. It affects anything that is chronically stressed. So while these animals in captivity are under stress and immunocompromised, then all of these come in high densities, exposure to huge numbers of pathogens and parasites and all manner of things. They're vectors that can carry diseases from one to the other. 
they're often living in squalor, right? We have to feed them large portions of the year, so we have to feed them grasses and grains. We store those. That attracts all manner of rodents and all of their diseases and their parasites, and it's a biological soup, right? So then we add to that with antibiotics and vaccines, and what we're doing is that we're amplifying, we're accelerating evolution. And then biology starts to take over. We get selection. The ones that are susceptible to disease die. The ones that are resistant live on. And it gradually becomes an, uh, an incredibly powerful tool for enhancement of disease. But we add to this because we select in domestication for what we want. We want meat, we want eggs, we want wool, we don't want wild animals trying to kill us and we don't want them trying to escape. We want docility and so that's what we breed for. That's how you go from a wolf to a poodle. So while we're making these changes and they're pretty dramatic sometimes on the outside, inside it's just as dramatic. So. When we're doing this, we're vastly reducing the brain size of the animal. This was put together by Australian National University, a variety of different animals. The difference in brain size between domestics and their wild counterparts. The best example I know is, is sheep. A wild sheep's brain is 50% bigger than a domestic. So the final thing in this whole thing is because our animals in, in domestication are valuable, we take them with us wherever we go or whether we want to ship them. It's impossible to move an animal without moving all the diseases and parasites and so on that live in them and on them. So we're, you think of moving animals as moving packages that contain not just the animal but everything that lives in it and on it. So you put all of those factors together and this is what you get, this incredible accelerated evolution of the virulence of the pathogens and the resistance of the hosts. So how serious is this? Well, the University of Washington at Pullman took six healthy bighorn sheep, wild sheep, all healthy, and six domestic sheep, and they just co-housed them. They put them together to see what would happen. The first bighorn was dead in four days. The last one was dead in 71 days. You don't have to do this experiment anymore. UC Davis summarized the data. 100% of the wild sheep succumb to diseases the domestics don't even know they have. So if that's sheep, what about people? These are just a few of the diseases that have come to us from animals. And domestication is playing a huge role in most of them. And it turns out that these Bacteria, the viruses, the fungus, the protein diseases, all of these things are not just causing acute diseases, they're also causing chronic diseases as well, including cancers. So the viral disease everybody's probably aware now of now is HPV, human papillomavirus that causes cervical cancer. It's obviously not just viruses, bacteria are playing a role. This is Barry Marshall, a physician from Australia who famously proved that ulcers were not just caused by stress, they were caused by bacteria, Helicobacter pylori, and so he famous, the medical community laughed at him. So he infected himself, cured himself with antibiotics, and 20 years later, 2005, they had to give him a Nobel Prize. Well, it turns out that that bacteria is not just causing ulcers, it's responsible for most stomach cancers and most GI cancers as well. So the final thing that I want to say about you know, this background is an example of C. Gordon Hewitt. This guy was Canada's Dominion zoologist in those conferences to protect wildlife to try to rescue it. So his great work, the seminal work, the conservation of the wildlife of Canada had to be pu published posthumously by his wife because he had returned from a, a, a Commission on Conservation uh, meeting in Montreal where he contracted the famous uh, 1918 Spanish flu and it took his healthy life in nine days, just after his 35th birthday. The Spanish flu came from chickens. So fortunately for us, the vital work of these people went on but it was not understood. It took a long time to replenish our wildlife, and then unfortunately, none of this was understood and it was forgotten, and so by the 1980s, there was a huge move to reverse all of this stuff. They wanted to put a price back on the head of wildlife. They wanted to forget all that stuff, 
because they were arrogant enough to think that they could change things and they wanted to go one step further. They wanted to um, take it to this point where they wanted to farm it. They wanted to domesticate it. Well, why game farm? What was the purpose? They identified these um, products that they were going to do, venison, velvet, uh, urine, and so-called shooters. We need to look carefully at these and see what they are. Well, this is what velveting looks like. This picture was taken in Alberta. This is absolutely brutal. It's produced, it's living, growing bone tissue, so it's highly innervated so that the animals develop proprioception and awareness of where those antlers are so that they can use them to defend themselves so they don't get entangled in their habitat and that kind of thing. Well, that's when they cut this off. It's absolutely brutal and it's produced for something that doesn't even work. For an aphrodisiac, that's ridiculous. The second product that we need to be concerned about, oh, by the way, velvet antler is highly uh, vascular and innervated, contains all kinds of diseases, including CWD. Urine, they want hunters to take this product out in our most precious habitat. It can contain all kinds of diseases. It's coming from game farms where they have huge numbers of diseases. Um, these are what shooters look like these mutant antlered nonsensical things that they turn loose in a fenced area where they can't get away as captive targets for, I don't know what we should call it, capital amusement. This is Bambi in a barrel, it's ridiculous. I've hunted my entire life, this isn't hunting. Now, they tried to base all of this game farming nonsense on economics, but they had never done any economic analysis. I was taking a bunch of resource economics and micro and macro and all this stuff when this was happening, and so I started asking questions about the economics of this. Well, it turned out that they had never done any analyses. They didn't know what they were doing. It was basically a pyramid scheme, and it was never economic and won't be. This is how well our governments looked at it. Alberta's analysis is on the left. It was 11 pages thin, double space. Wyoming was a different story. Wyoming was home to some of the finest wildlife biologists on the planet, and when they wanted to do this, they got up on their hind legs and they said, like hell. So they commissioned Bob Lanka and Rich Gonzell and a number of other people down there, and they convened a comprehensive analysis. That's what it looks like. Those are the appendices of the science. What did they find? They found diseases, parasites, genetic pollution, habitat loss, destruction of our system of conservation, horrific economics. None of it made any sense. We were pleading with our governments at the time to do a similar kind of thing, and they ignored us. First Nations were vehemently opposed to this. They said this is an affront to their most sacred beliefs. My favorite quote at the time came from Charles Beaver, the Big Stone Cree Band. I was doing some environmental consulting for him. I laid this stuff out, and he said, what the bleep is this? Uh, he said, now they want to put the animals on reservations. So they ignored all of the science. They ignored First Nations. They ignored the economics. They ignored everything, because friends and relatives of cabinet ministers were in on the ground floor of this. This is what we got, they pushed it through. This is not a natural environment. If one of these animals has an infectious disease, they're all gonna get it. So what happened? Well, we legalized it in 1987, it took less than three years, this happened. Massive epidemic of bovine tuberculosis on game farms across Canada. BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario. It came in from four different places. And it was a massive problem. It went to cattle, it went to pigs, it went to bison, and 42 people in my province had to begin treatment for bovine tuberculosis because of elk farming. It cost all of Canada TB-free status for all of agriculture, worth more than a billion dollars. This is Colorado where we got some of this from. But the astonishing part about this whole thing is that we didn't even have this cleaned up before in the spring of 1996, two things happened almost the same day. First of all, the UK had to go before Parliament and admit that people were actually dying of BSE, of mad cow disease. This is a prion disease, the same family as CWD, and the Canadian government, two weeks after, admitted that there was CWD on a game farm in Saskatchewan. So we don't have time to get into the deep science, but I want to talk a little bit about what prion disease looks like. This is the best way that I can understand it. I, uh, I don't know if it'll help you or not, but this slide, this is a picture I was hiking up to Window Mountain Lake in Alberta, and I have, happened to be passing by this amazing spider web. It was huge, it was like, you know, 18 inches across, and, and the sun was refracting through the filaments, and it made this kind of rainbow. 
So I managed to get it, uh, a picture of it. Um, and the reason that it's important is that I had read that the amyloid fibrils that make up spider silk are the exact same proteins that are at the core of all of these amyloid plaque diseases. They basically Velcro to each other, and the, the strength of that is so amazing that you can't get them, your body can't break them apart. So this is the basis of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Huntington's, ALS, CJD, all of the prion diseases like mad cow, scrapie, CWD, and the human versions, versions I, I mentioned, uh, CJD, but also GSS, that, that, um, uh, Gerstmann, Straussler, Schenker syndrome, fatal familial insomnia, a bunch of others. But the issue is that this is not just something that is nasty and is always fatal. It is so persistent that the pathogen itself, because it's just protein, it's not strictly alive, so you can't kill it. So they're resistant to pretty much everything. Disinfectants, alcohol, formaldehyde, detergents, protein enzymes, desiccation, um, radiation, freezing. Paul Brown at Bethesda took diseased brains over crucibles and started cranking up the heat to try and find out how much heat is going to be required to deal with this, to render it ineffective. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but at 600 degrees Celsius, just shy of the melting point of aluminum, right, the sample weights had been reduced by more than 99%. There was nothing left but white ash. He reconstituted with saline and successfully infected five of 35 hamsters. This is what we're dealing with. Now, what I've been working on for 25 years is, is the role of domestication in disease. Is it playing a role in prion disease? Absolutely. We don't completely understand it, but there is no scrapie in wild sheep. There's no BSE in wild bovids. There's no TME in wild mink. There's no felid uh, uh, encephalopathy in wild cats. And Canada and the United States have proven absolutely there's no CWD. This is not a longstanding indigenous disease of our wildlife. This is new. So we imported all of our CWD in Canada with game farm animals from the United States. This is the cover of the expert scientific panel that proved that. It was imported into game farm animals in Saskatchewan. It was spread all over hell because they wouldn't follow what the scientists wanted to do with the tracing. 2001, the United States Department of Agriculture declared a state of emergency. In Alberta, 2007, we put helicopters in the air and we shot 10,000 deer on our border with Saskatchewan trying to control this. It wasn't enough. And the public, the hunters, the, the, the ranchers, the farmers, the outfitters, everybody shut it down because they didn't, when they saw these pictures, they thought this was horrific. So in 2008, I wrote this book for governments. I put it in a three-inch binder with all the background science because I'm not Greenpeace. I don't protest. I don't do any of that stuff. I don't hang banners. I pull together the best science I can. I put this in a three-inch binder with all the science and I sent six copies like that to every government that was relevant in Canada. And then waited and waited and waited. And I finally got a response to this book um, a, little bo a little more than a year later, I think it was. Uh, the Harper government announced that they were giving, they ponied up a million dollars worth of taxpayer money and gave it to the game farming lobby to promote game farming. So where this goes, it grows, it spreads, it persists, it evolves, and now the field studies are mimicking what the modeling said. We're looking at potential extinction models for wildlife. We have this in 24 states, two provinces. It is in the heart of our ag areas. It's in our best wildlife habitats. But don't blow it out of proportion, because even in Saskatchewan, our worst infected province, the vast majority of our wildlife is still disease-free. We have a chance if we can convince politicians to act. But when we tried to pull all this together, right, um, we were not really very effective. Um, we, we have an ace up our sleeves, put it that way, because we're looking at the risk of whether this potentially comes to people. And I'm not going to go into great detail on this, but suffice that the, the best scientists in the world are looking at this and they're saying, this is ridiculous. We cannot be eating this.
It's about the same in terms of risk that Mad Cow was, and now we have high exposure rates. This is Dr. Kong at Case Western. He just finished creating disease in two of 20 transgenic uh, humanized mice. And so these were his results. He sent me all of his background. Um, and the bottom line to this whole thing is what happens if this does infect people and behaves in us like it does in deer? because in deer, this is highly contagious. They spew out copious amounts of prions for up to a year before they ever get sick in urine, feces, and saliva, and then it persists in the soil. And the essence of this whole thing is that the scientists are saying, if this were ever to behave in us like it does in deer, we have no idea how to stop it, because you could be infected for 10 years not have any idea that you have it, and be spreading it around all over the place, an always fatal disease, and suddenly you have this spectacular neuropathology, and a few months later, eight, 10 months later, you're dead. So these are some quotes from some scientists. I don't have time to read these, but again, these guys are saying this is the most outrageous human susceptibility ex experiment ever undertaken. And then we come to this. Chris Johnson at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and uh, Claudio Soto at the University of Texas Medical Center, they've looked at the potential for this to spread through plants, either from urine, feces, and saliva that can affect the outside of plants. So Claudio Soto took plants, he exposed them to urine and feces from infected deer, and then aggressively washed them five times trying to wash it off. Used PMCA, proved oh, it's still there, still in the infectious range. Every single lab animal that he's fed it to got sick and died, right? Then he thought, well, you know, what about this? I've heard Chris Johnson's doing this work where he's just growing plants in soil that's infected with this stuff. So what about that? So he grew some wheat plants, used PMCA. Sure enough, this is taken up through the root system, transferred up into the aerial tissues, the stems, leaves, and, and uh, seeds, and probably the pollen even of the plants. And so we're facing a potential economic threat that's just like the financial crisis. Because if there's a threat, if the, this is a threat to deer all over the world, so there's some of the deer around the world that are proven susceptible to CWD. And it could come in our ag products, right? Well, are they looking at this? These are five different articles from the UK. You know, this deer disease from America could wipe, all the, wipe out all the deer in Britain. They're definitely looking at this. And the comparison between Canada and, and North America and the UK, I put Britain and their BSE areas in red and superimposed it over North America so you can see the difference. CWD is now the world's largest biomass of prions in global history. So a couple of years ago, the, P, uh, the um, uh, Newswire in New York contacted me. They wanted to use some of my video in a story that they were doing about game farming versus traditional agriculture, and they wanted to use some of my footage, and I said, well, okay, but I didn't tell them about the plant study because we're not ready. So this is a picture from Times Square in New York where the story was running. They covered this, and I got a friend to take this picture, but um, we're not ready. This is a tremendous threat to um, our wildlife because ag, when ag is threatened, if they think that our deer are infected vermin that are shedding these prions into their landscapes and threatening their bottom line, then what do they do? Well, this is in Nebraska, it's in Kansas, it's in Iowa, it's in Ohio, it's in Wisconsin, it's in Alberta and Saskatchewan, in the core of our ag areas, right? And when ag is attacked, they think, from wildlife, they turn on it. That's what they've done in every single circumstance. They demand the extermination of wildlife to protect their interest. So I want to put some of this into perspective so that we can understand. This work was done by Paul McCready, who's a, this amazing aeronautical engineer who did the Gossamer um, Condor that was the first human-powered flight across the English Channel. But when he was... Uh, a grandfather who was worried about his grandkids and, and he was worried about environmental issues and he thought, well, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can contribute to this. So he measured the biomass of vertebrates on land and in air, not fish. And 
He explained in a TED talk that you can watch that 10,000 years ago, humans, livestock, and pets made up less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of that biomass. By the time he put this out in 1997, humans, livestock, and pets make up more than 97% of that biomass around the world. So the people in this room, those of us who are trying to protect wildlife, that's what we're trying to protect, that last 3%. With wildlife, we get this. We get survival of the fittest. With this nonsensical, uneconomic nonsense, this is what they are asking for. This is ridiculous. That deer didn't even live long enough to become a target for a paid shoot. So in our paper, we have four action items that we have to get our governments to understand. We have to contain the spread of this. We have to stop the movement of live servants and all potentially infected carcasses, animal parts, products, everything that might have a risk of moving this. We have to mandate and implement for hunters convenient, cost-free, rapid testing so that every single animal from a, a diseased area can be tested. We have to make sure that this is not going to the food chain. We have, in North America now, somewhere between seven and 15,000 CWD infected animals being consumed by hunter families every year. This is unconscionable. If even one person is shown to get CWD and die, right, regardless of whether it behaves in us and like it does in deer where it's contagious, what will happen to the confidence in our food sources if this is coming up in plants? How do we deal with that? Now, do we have some, some politicians that, are, uh, that have an open mind and an open ear to this? Yeah, we do. Dr. Carolyn Bennett, who's now the Minister of Indigenous and Northern Affairs, is, she was concerned about this when she was the Federal Minister of State for Public Health. And she asked me to do a primer for her and her staff on the risk to people and so on. She's taken a firm stand against this, but none of our governments, federal or provincial, can do what they need to do without your help. The governments have to know that you understand this and you're demanding to protect everything. So we're back to Bill Gates. Bill Gates, I said that he was right about this, but here's what he missed. We are facing uh, threats from diseases and he was advocating we have to have better vaccines, faster rapid testing, we have to have a military distribution system to deal with these diseases. He's not asking where the hell the diseases are coming from. We're creating them. We have to knock this off, but it's not Bill Gates' fault. So I don't know if you ever saw this movie, Contagion, Steven Soderbergh film. He is an all ensemble cast, Matt Damon, Gwyneth Paltrow, Jude Law, it was an amazing film, right? Well, the science advisor on this film, I saw a New York Times op-ed about this, the real threats of contagion. I thought, well, finally, you know, somebody's gonna point out this, not a single word about where the pathogens are coming from. This is one of the world's foremost virologists is hiding in plain sight right in front of him. So, I don't know if you saw this film, Concussion. This is a similar kind of brain disease that's caused by concussions. CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, is a prion disease, right? Well, guess what? In Colorado, they're using CWD and testing to try to figure out if they can somehow magically figure out how to solve some of these problems, but good luck with that. I mean, we've had Alzheimer's and all these other diseases for a long time. We don't have treatments, let alone cures for any of them. So you put all this stuff together, really what this is, is it's con concussion meets contagion meets the big short. Because when the companies in, in Europe decide that they can make billions of euros by putting up trade barriers to our ag products to protect their deer, what are we gonna do? We're not ready for this. So with your help, we need to convince the politicians to do what we need to do. And I'm hopeful we can get there. One of the ways that Vince and I have been trying to deal with this is by trying to understand we have to put this in a film because people don't understand. Politicians don't understand. Ag industry doesn't understand. The public health agencies don't understand. So, with your help, I'm absolutely certain that we can make a hell of a difference and we can protect everything from wildlife to human health to agriculture to First Nations treaties to everything that we care about. 